Did you know that some jinn are actually Muslim? If we read Surah Al-Jinn in the Quran, we can learn so much about these beings. So first things first, they're actually almost like invisible beings which exist in a different plane, which is why we can't see them. But they were given free will just like us, which means some can follow Islam and some choose not to. So the first part of this surah is the Muslim jinn talking to their fellow jinn. The surah starts with Prophet Muhammad وسلم, saying, it has been revealed to me that a group of jinn listened to the Quran and said to their fellow jinn, indeed, we have heard a wonderful recitation. It leads to right guidance, so we believed in it, and we will never associate anyone with our Lord in worship. Now we believe that our Lord, exalted in his majesty, has neither taken a mate nor offspring. So they affirm the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he doesn't have offspring, that he doesn't have mates, and that the Quran does in fact lead to the right guidance towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They also know that some of their fellow jinn don't follow this path. And in fact, not only do they follow this path, they speak falsehoods about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the next few ayahs say, and that the foolish of us used to utter outrageous falsehoods about Allah. We certainly thought that humans and jinn would never speak lies about Allah. And some men used to seek refuge with some jinn, so they increased each other in wickedness. And those humans thought just like you jinn, that Allah would not resurrect anyone for judgment. So the idea that the humans and the jinn increase each other in wickedness might be a new idea for you to grasp. So if we go to chapter 6 in the Quran, which is Surah Al-An'am, if we go to verse 128, Allah says, Consider the day he will gather them all together and say, O oh, assembly of jinn, you misled humans in great numbers. And their human associates will say, our Lord, we benefited from each other's company, but now we have reached the term which you have appointed for us. Then he will say, the fire is your home, yours to stay in forever except whoever Allah wills to spare. Surely your Lord is all wise, all knowing. So in the tafsir, we can see that one of the way these two beings feed off of each other is that jinns help humans with magic, and then humans follow the jinn for that reason. And by the humans following the jinn, the jinn feel this sense of importance. And when we all show up to the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reprimand both beings. There is no escaping the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we go a little bit further into Surah Al-Jinn, we discover some really interesting things. Like in verse 8, when the jinn say, Earlier we tried to reach heaven for news, only to find it filled with stern guards and shooting stars. We used to take positions up there for eavesdropping, but whoever dares to eavesdrop now will find a flare lying in wait for them. So before the time of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the jinn actually used to go to heaven, eavesdrop on the news that was happening, and then transfer that information to the fortune tellers here on earth. But the tafsir of Ibn Kathir tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped this practice from happening by protecting the sky with stern guards and shooting stars so that the jinn wouldn't be able to steal anything from the Quran and give that information to the soothsayers, which would only confuse things for Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam to deliver his message to the ummah. There's also a hadith in Sunnah Ibn Majah 194 in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, when Allah decrees a matter in heaven, the angels beat their wings in submission to his decree, like a chain beating a rock. Then when fear is banished from their hearts, they say, what is it that your Lord has said? They say the truth, and he is the most high, the most great. He said, then the eavesdropper from among the jinn, listen out for that, one above another. So when one of them hears the words, they pass it along to the one beneath him. The shooting stars may strike him before he can pass it on to the one beneath him, and the latter can pass it on to the soothsayer or sorcerer. Or it may not strike him before he can pass it on. And he adds 100 lies to it, and only the word which is overheard from heaven is true. So going back to the surah, the jinn do tell us, among us are those who are righteous and those who are less so. We have been of different factions, just like humans. There are those of us who follow Islam and those of us who don't. Some other things to keep in mind is that jinn were created from fire, which we can see both in the Quran and in the Hadith. In the Quran, in chapter 15, verse 27, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, As for the jinn, we created them earlier from smokeless fire. And in the Hadith, Riyat al Salihin, 1846, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, reported that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Angels were created from light, jinn were created from a smokeless flame of fire, and Adam was created from that which you have been told, like sounding clay. That being said, though some jinn are Muslim, so many jinn have the ability to influence us and lead us to kufr in the same way that shaitan does. So it is absolutely imperative that you seek protection from the influence of jinn, and that you seek protection from being possessed by jinn. In the hadith Sunnah at-Tirmidhi 2058, 
Abu Sa'id reported that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would seek refuge from jinn and from the evil eye of man until two chapters of refuge were revealed, Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas. After they were revealed, he held to both of them and left everything else. Meaning that these two surahs, these incredibly short surahs, Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas, were used by the Prophet himself to seek protection from jinn and from evil eye. These surahs amongst revelations like Ayat Al-Kursi should be more than enough to protect us from the jinn. Ya Nur Al-Hilal Aqbil Ta'al Fashawq Ta'al Wal-Qalb Sama Nahwa Sama Do we have pets in Jannah? What if I want cats? Uh, what if I want dogs? What if I want something else? The Prophet Sallallahu definitely talked about animals in Jannah, but they are heavenly animals. Bedouin came to the Prophet Sallallahu and he said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, I love horses, so I'm not a camel guy, I'm a horse guy. Are there horses in Jannah? And the Prophet وسلم, he responded and he said, if Allah enters you into Jannah, you shall be brought a horse of rubies with two wings, and then you shall be carried on it, and then it will take you wherever you want. So you have horses, you have camels, and they're not just beautiful, to look at, they actually serve a purpose of taking you around Jannah as you please as well. My perspective on the Prophet Muhammad wasalam, has changed a lot over the course of my life. When I was little, I thought of him wasalam, as a moving ball of light, which is not the worst way to you know view it but it's not the most accurate either in my prepubescent years up until early adolescence i viewed him as this super serious super devout muslim who was borderline robotic i knew he was pious i knew he was a good man and i knew i had to take example from him وسلم, but i viewed him as this very strict very rigid muslim and i couldn't see that as a realistic example to emulate so i admired him وسلم, but at that time i saw the act of following his footsteps to be something so heavy and so like close to undoable but now today that's changed now i don't want to rant too much about this but all i'm saying is if you took the time and effort to actually study the life of prophet muhammad والسلام, take the time to know how much he praised allah how he treated his companions his people how he treated animals how he treated his enemies his wives his children you will find something so human about his piety and something so human about his goodness Needless to say, I no longer see him as this robotic, strict, rigid, entirely serious Muslim. He was fully committed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, that's true, but he was so human about it. I, ha I don't have the words to describe. He wasn't only a prophet, he was a leader. He was a husband, a father, he was a companion. He held so many positions. He truly, truly is khairu khalqillah, the best of Allah's creation. And whatever he has given us, we take. Oh,